Right. Uh, my name is Bartosz Czmierowski. It's my pleasure to talk in front of you. It's my honor to talk in front of you, all patients, family members, and guests and colleagues. Uh, <clears throat> today, I will concentrate in my, uh, in my speech on management of patients who underwent surgery and the, the melanoma was uh, removed. I will give a general introduction about uh, the frequency of melanoma, the diagnosis of the disease. So this is a general melanoma statistics. And in 2010, it was estimated that we had about 68,000 case, new cases of melanoma and about 8,700 patients died of melanoma. It's, uh, skin cancers are very common. Melanoma is actually not, uh, probably the least common skin cancer. Uh, it's only about 4% of all skin cancers, even maybe less, but it accounts for more, almost 80% of deaths uh, of skin cancers. Uh, it, it can affect patients of people of all ages, but it's always also concerning that about 25% of patients with melanoma are younger than the under the age of 40. And what was recently noted that melanoma is the leading cause of cancer death in women ages 25 to 35, and the second cause of death in women ages uh, 30 to 34. Uh, since uh, cancers are not so common in younger, popu in younger population, melanoma is, uh, that's why it's an um, unfortunate leader. When we look at all our databases and we see at the, uh, we look at the number of cases of, of different cancers, in men melanoma is, no, is a number five and f in estimated new cases in women melanoma is number seven. Fortunately, melanoma is not in the first number 10 cases in, in, of cancers causing death in patients as we, as we saw. Um, other frequencies higher, a lot of patients are treated surgically and uh, uh, this treatment is successful and the disease is eliminated. So what's the lifetime risk of melanoma in the United States? As we see, the, the incidence of melanoma is ro rising quite st uh, steeply. In the recent years, this rise may be slowed down, but in 1935, the, ch the chances that you develop melanoma is only one per 1,500 uh, people. But in 2000, this chances increased to one to over 75. There are different reasons. The frequency uh, uh, is higher. We are more exposed to sunlight. As we know, this is one of the main factors. And we also live longer, so uh, we have a higher chance to develop uh, melanoma. These are the basic things. We always say, you know, melanoma uh, uh, starts from a mole or looks like a mole initially. So we always educate our patients to say, you know, what are the rules? How can I differentiate a normal mole from a more malignant lesion? And we use this A, B, C, D rule. Uh, so usually benign moles are um, symmetric. If they become asymmetric, this is a higher risk with might be melanoma. We look at the borders of the, of the mole on the skin. If, it, if the border is again irregular, this is, uh, this is a higher risk that it is melanoma. We look at color. A melanoma does not have to be black or brown, can be, uh, uh, can be a, a pink in color too, but most of them are dark, at least the primary lesions, and um, very often they have different shades of brown from very light to dark in one mole, and this is a higher risk of my melanoma. And finally, we look at the diameter of lesions. A lot of patients uh, have multiple moles and not necessarily uh, they have to turn into melanoma. And it's very often dif difficult to differentiate which mo mole is benign and which one is, uh, might be already melanoma. But if it's increasing in size and if the diameter is bigger than six millimeters, which we say it's a lot, uh, um, about the size of a pencil eraser, um, then this is a higher risk maybe melanoma. Uh, especially if there are several features, A, B, C, D features, if you have all four of them, the risk that it might be melanoma is almost 90%. So 
we always say, okay, there's melanoma, the patient undergoes, uh, uh, undergoes a biopsy. And then there's a the question, what's important in the pathology report when we see, uh, 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 when, when we get it from a pathologist? It's so confusing, there are a lot of terms. We, an important thing is the depth of invasion, and which is always expressed in millimeters, and we traditionally call it the Breslow depth of invasion. When we look at the presence of ulceration, patients who have ulceration have a little bit worse, have a worse prognosis, and we talk what ulceration means. Also, in the early stages of melanoma, it's extremely important how many cells are dividing, and this is what we call a mitotic rate. Finally, is, are there any satellite de deposits of melanoma in the, prim in the primary site? If there are satellite deposits, it suggests that melanoma already started spreading to other places. And finally, if a, if a primary lesion was removed, was it removed with clear margins and how wide these margins were? So this is my <laughs> diagram, which I, I borrowed a lot of pictures from the internet for this diagram. <laughs> Uh, and what do, what do we do, how do we, have, what are the initial steps in the management of, of melanoma? So we have a suspicious mole, the first thing which is, happens, and usually happens in a dermatology office or a primary care physician's office, that they perform biopsy. We prefer a punch biopsy over a shave biopsy. Uh, this is easier to, um, to analyze it under microscope and the information is more detailed. Then it goes to a pathologist who looks at it under microscope and tells us about all the features I mentioned in the previous slide. When the patient is referred to a surgeon and the surgeon performs wide excision, and depending how deep melanoma goes into the skin, you, the surgeon also assesses local lymph nodes and, and checks if this melanoma spread to the local lymph nodes or if the lymph nodes are spared. In the past, we used, to, we used to perform the lymph node dissection, so all the lymph nodes from the area were removed. Right now, we know that uh, this is not necessarily uh, needed, but it's extremely important to check the first lymph node, the one which is the closest to the primary, primary melanoma, and we call it a sentinel lymph node. If this lymph node is negative, the chances that other lymph nodes are involved are less than 15%. But if this lymph node was positive, then the, there is a good chance that other lymph nodes in this area might be involved. And that's why it's recommended, it's a standard of care, to uh, refer the patient for dissection of all lymph nodes in, in this area. At that time, we usually get also imaging studies of the whole body to see if this melanoma did not travel to other, uh, to other organs. So how do we stage melanoma? We always hear about stages, and sometimes I see that patients get confused because one of the features in the pathology report, there's also a, a Clark level, which uses also Roman numericals, and sometimes people will say Clark level four, it means that they have stage four of melanoma. It's not. We, um, a Clark level just tells us about the depth of invasion into the skin, actually the layer in, or in, of the skin uh, which is affected by melanoma. Um, stage 1 and stage 2 disease is still a local disease. It's, it did not spread from the primary site, and we differentiate based on the presence of ulceration and the depth of invasion. If it travels to the local lymph nodes, then we have a stage 3 disease, and also there are subgroups. But if it travels beyond the local lymph nodes, travel to other organs, brain, lungs, bone, or multiple lymph node sites, then at that time we talk about stage four disease. The prognosis of patients depends on the stage. And here I'm showing you stage one through two. As you, you see, each stage has some subgroups. And when we look at 10 years, the survival of patients at 10 years with melanoma is very good for stage one, it's more than 90%, but it's much worse for stage two when, when it ranges from 42% to 68% depending, uh, I'm sorry, to 68% depending on the depth of invasion and presence of ulceration. This is a similar picture showing prognosis of patients with stage three, so this is the, the disease that involves already lymph nodes. At 10 years, 
if you have only microscopic involvement of one lymph node, the prognosis is still good, it's about 68%. But if you, have star, if you start having more lymph nodes involved, or they are palpable, uh, then the prognosis much, is much worse. Finally, this is a slide showing the prognosis of patients with metastatic disease. As you can see, especially the patients who have metastasis in um, uh, non uh, in visceral organs such as liver, bone, or brain, the prognosis at five years is less than 10%. It's a little bit better prognosis if, you, if melanoma just spread to the skin or, or lymph nodes. This prognosis on this graph is about 30%. And of course, this is what we are fighting, and you heard a lot about pre in, in, the, in the press recently, when there, have been, there has been progress and improvement in survival of patients. We still do not have a long-term follow-up, but we believe we can find and we can change the curves. So the question is, I'm talking about the surgically removed melanoma, not the one that spread to other organs. I said, can, do we have a chance to reduce the risk of recurrence of a disease? I'm showing you that, uh, uh, that although everything was removed, still the disease can come back. And um, so we identify patients who might be at especially high risk for recurrence. <laughs> so these will be all the patients with lymph node involvement. Uh, patients whose primary disease was m deeper than two millimeters, and in addition, they, the tumor had ulceration, the primary tumor. And then finally, they did not have ulceration, but it went deep in the, in the skin. It means more than four millimeters. And I always talk to my patients. I usually have a caliper in the office, and I'm trying to show them how much two millimeters or four millimeters is. With majority of the cancers, if it goes just, if a cancer has a size of four millimeters, it's usually a, a good sign, but for melanoma, not anymore. A lot of treatments, I gave just you a few examples, but many more were tested in this setting. The lymph nodes were removed, and there's no melanoma on the scans, but you are at risk for the recurrence. The chemotherapy was tested, different vaccines like BCG vaccines, Cornobacterium, um, hormonal agents were tested in the settings. And unfortunately, so far, all these agents failed and did not show the improvement in, in the length of, uh, a length of life or even a decrease of the chance of recurrence. So the main studies which appeared, and this is the uh, interferon is right now the only agent that is approved in this setting for treatment of patients with resected melanoma, is interferon alpha, um, known as intron A, and it was based on this ECOG 1684 study. As you know, a lot of you went through the treatment of interferon. This is a cumbersome treatment. Initially, we start with intravenous treatment for four weeks, which you get infusion five days a week, and then you get a weekend of break, and you, and you come back again. After your four weeks of infusion, you embark on 11 months of the therapy when you give yourself shots under the skin and three times a week. What are the benefits of this treatment? So in the, this trial I was talking about showed, showed that uh, there is about nine month prolongation of median recurrence of the disease. So it means, when, of course, as you see, these are all average, or average numbers. Some patients benefit more, some patients do not benefit from this treatment. When we look at the number of people who are alive at five years, um, not alive, I'm sorry, who, who did not have recurrence of disease at five years, this difference was 11%. The interferon improved from 26% to 37%. I do have to say that there were follow-up studies that showed that this benefit might not be as pronounced as in this study. Now we are looking how long do people live, does it prolong life, not only delays the recurrence of the disease. The same study showed that there was about one year prolongation in survival for this median person. So an average survival in this study was 2.8 by 3.8 uh, years if they did not receive interferon and 3.8 years if they did. <coughs> 
And finally, there was about 9% improvement in overall survival if we look at five years. So there were about 9% of patients more alive, at, <laughs> more patients were alive at, nine, at, at five years by 9%. Um, interferon, as you all know, especially the ones who went through the treatment, comes with side effects. Some side effects are very, very common. They do not, they do not have, have to be very severe, but there are also severe side effects. And mainly, almost all patients develop some degree of fatigue, and especially during the infusion time, the first four weeks of treatment, a majority of patients have a fever. They may have mm, flu symptoms with muscle aches. They develop often nausea and vomiting. And there are also blood work abnormalities, which we monitor regularly when patients are receiving. And it's a decrease in white, uh, receiving the treatment, mm, decrease in the white count or red cell count, and worsening of liver functions. Luckily, these changes are reversible, and if the dose is decreased or the, the treatment is stopped, mm, um, they come back to normal. And finally, this might be a debilitating thing, is depression. And fatigue can be also debilitating, especially for patients who are on treatment for a long time. But in March of this year, a new form, it's also interferon alpha, but it's a new, new form of interferon alpha was approved for treatment of patients with melanoma. This drug on, on American market is called Silatron. Actually, it's called everywhere Silatron, but the whole of the world, the rest of the world spells, with, spells it with C, we spell it with S. It's given in a little bit different way because this is a pegylated form. It means it works longer, does not require such frequent injections. For the first eight weeks, you, get, you give yourself injection at a higher dose once a week. And then you continue giving once, the injections once a week, but at a lower dose. But the, the intended duration of the therapy is five years. The assumption to, to prolong this therapy was, since we see that the interferon can really delay the disease in the number of patients, but we don't know how much it inf influences the um, length of life, there was a question, can we delay it for so long that finally the patients start living longer? So these are, uh, these are the results that got the drug approved. And as you see, the numbers are very similar. So it's again, for a median person, the graph looks a little bit different, but when we look at the numbers, there is a nine month prolongation of, of recurrence of the disease. And there is about 11% increase in the relapse of a disease here at four years because there was not enough of follow-up at that time. But when we looked at the survival of patients, as you see, these curves were super, uh, superimposed. So there was, despite lengthening of the therapy, we did not see significant improvement in the length of life. As you may know, and there was a lot in press, there was, we just came back from ASCO, our ASCO meeting, so the meeting of American Society of Clinical Oncology, and melanoma was one of the most important and interesting topics during this con uh, conference. It, the main progress was in metastatic disease, but there was also some interesting information about patients who were surgically managed. There was a study showing that four weeks of, of intravenous interferon is not sufficient. It showed that if we use only four weeks of intravenous interferon, the prognosis of patients is the same as patients who did not receive interferon at all. There was a, there were alternative ways to give interferon when instead of continuing with a subcutaneous interferon, why not to repeat this four weeks of intravenous induction for four times every other month. Uh, the results showed that these two treatments are comparable. Uh, some patients try to uh, want to have the therapy finished early, then this would be the way to go. But some patients, uh, but also you pay for that, that during this month of intravenous therapy, you have more side effects. So I don't know if it's gonna change the standard of care with so a year of interferon, or right now five years with, sub, with pegylate interferon, but this is what was presented um, two weeks ago, a week ago. Finally, there was, there was a follow-up on Silatron, uh, 
and um, uh, I'll show you a picture uh, in, in a second, but it shows that probably the patients who benefit most are the patients who have this ulceration in the primary lesion and who had lymph node involvement, but this was only on the microscopic level. So this is, I, this, you, sh you saw already this graph, it was on a different background, so it may look a little bit different. This was on Silatron, the data from 2007, when there we have a longer follow-up. Unfortunately, this, in the longer follow-up, these curves got much closer, and the benefit in delaying of the recurrence of a disease on Silatron might be smaller than we in initially anticipated. So what's ulceration? As you see, when this is this is epidermis, the outside layer, and then when we have dermis, if we have growing melanoma, uh, we, the, the pathologist always looks: is this outer layer, the epidermis, intact over the pr growing primary melanoma or not? If they, they see that the epidermis is broken under the microscope, this is what we call an ulceration. So it's something different than just a skin ulcer. It must be assessed by a pathologist under the microscope. And when we looked at this, uh, this population of patients treated with Silatron, the, the primary lesion had ulceration, and the lymph nodes were involved, but on a microscopic level, they were not palpable. As you see, this difference in, was much more dramatic. So what should we use in these patients? Should we use intron A, the intravenous four weeks and subcutaneous year, or should we use Silatron, which is subcutaneous for five years? I think both treatments are, are, are acceptable, and depending on the patient, the patient's preference would be probably the most important. We have to remember that the first four weeks on intron A, they happen in doctor's office, and you get it five, five days a week. Uh, in, uh, and then you start giving yourself in, in, uh, subcutaneous injections. On Silatron, everything is done at home. It, you have to come to follow up appointments, so your blood work can be checked and your doctor can assess the side effects, but you don't have to come for infusions. At the same time, the length of treatment on intravenous interferon is one year. But if we use Silatron, we try to, we try to use five years of treatment. Honestly speaking, not, every, not everyone was for five years. Only actually a small percentage of patients remained on treatment of Silatron for five years. Majority of them discontinued because of fatigue and depression and other side effects. Side effects are actually similar. Maybe they are more severe during your infusion time, especially at that time you get a lot of body aches, fevers, uh, chills, which may be less common when you give yourself subcutaneous injections. Uh, different patient populations were studied in these two trials. So Silatron was studied only in patients who had lymph node involvement. Intron A was studied in patients who had lymph node involvement, but also in the patients, as I told you, whose disease, uh, whose melanoma was at least two millimeters in depth with ulceration or deeper than four millimeters. And who benefits? It's difficult to say. We always hate to analyze subgroups in our clinical trials because the, this information might be sometimes misleading. But there was some suggestion that patients who have palpable lymph nodes, maybe they would benefit from intron A, and patients who do not have palpable lymph nodes and had ulceration in the primary lesion, they would benefit from Silatron. Please remember these two drugs were not compared with each other, so I'm trying to look at, two, at separate clinical trials and draw conclusions, and this can be misleading. We always ask, is there any progress? We, interferon is an old drug, it's been around, it's a new formulation, but still it's the, sa it's the same old drug. So here at UCLA, we were involved very much in development of a new vaccine. About 60% of patients with melanoma, 60% right, of tumors of patients with melanoma have the specific peptide called MAGE-A3. Uh, this, is an, uh, this is a peptide present just uh, uh, in uh, your melanoma cells. And there was a clinical trial we just completed the accrual. Um, 1,300 patients were enrolled in this study. And were patients with 
palpable lymph nodes who underwent surgical resection were giving either this vaccine against the peptide. So we tried to uh, immunize patients against the peptide, which is in melanoma cells, as we tried to immunize against infectious diseases. And two-thirds of patients received the vaccine, and one-third of patients received placebo. As I told you, we just accrual just finished this week. We do not have any results of the study. We will be really waiting to see if this vaccine, something was reasonably benign, you get, un, you, you get your sh shot under the skin with very few side effects, is actually uh, uh, beneficial for our patients with stage 3 disease. Similarly, this study has not been f finished yet, or the accrual to the study has not been completed yet, but it's close to the meeting of the, of the accrual goal, is the use of ipilimumab, or Yervoy, in the setting of patients with stage 3 disease. You, I'm sure you heard a lot about using of Yervoy or ipilimumab in patients with metastatic disease, but we don't know if the same benefit will be for patients with early disease, stage 3 disease, who are at lower risk for disease progression than patients with stage 4 disease. So the design of the study was when the patients who had stage 3 disease, so must have had uh, lymph node involvement, underwent the lymph node dissection, and when patients were randomized either to treatment with intravenous epidemiumab, initially every th three weeks and then every three months, or they received the infusion of placebo. I mentioned at the beginning that the study still is accruing patients, it's very, it's very close to meeting its goal. This is a, also a very interesting study. We know that epidemiology comes with side effects, and so we are very cautious about using it uh, sooner than in patients with metastatic disease. It will, patients who had resected disease, they, their progression of a disease, if the disease progress happens later, because of that, I, we cannot anticipate when the results from the studies will be uh, available very soon. We may have some preliminary results in one year, but probably if this is even, even that is optimistic. So very often patients come to my office and say, oh, maybe we should use radiation therapy. Initially we thought that radiation therapy was not very helpful in, in uh, uh, treatment of melanoma. It is helpful in, treat, in treatment of local lesions in patients with metastatic disease, especially patients with brain metastasis. But what about patients whose disease was resected? And they are at risk for recurrence, but they do, right now they do not have any disease that we can measure on scans or on a physical exam. Radiation therapy is a local treatment, so we cannot expect that it's going to help the whole body. It's going to help the area in, in which the radiation therapy is delivered. Then we know that not everybody would benefit from radiation. That's why uh, there, there is a list of risk factors which increase the risk of local recurrence after the lymph nodes were, were removed. And people came up with a criteria of patients who are at risk for recurrence. If, the lymph, if melanoma was in the lymph node, but went beyond the capsule surrounding the lymph node, went to our surrounding tissues, then these patients are at higher risk. Similarly, if there were more than four lymph nodes involved, if the lymph nodes were bigger than three centimeters, so a little bit more than one inch, if neck lymph nodes were involved, this is a little bit higher risk, higher risk area. If melanoma was resected in the lymph nodes, but if sometime later it came back in the, same, in the same area in other lymph nodes that were not removed. And finally, some patient says, yes, my, I, my sentinel lymph node was involved, but I don't want to undergo surgery. I don't want to have all lymph nodes removed from, uh, from this area. So one could consider that they are at higher risk for local recurrence and maybe they should get radiation therapy. So finally, we, and it was presented actually two years ago at ASCO, we had a, a trial which was done mainly in Australia and New Zealand, although the sites in Europe and I think also in Brazil were involved. But patients underwent dissection, and this was this group of patients I discussed in the previous slide. We had 248 patients, and they were divided into two groups. Some of them got 20 days of radiation therapy to the area where the lymph nodes were dis uh, removed. 
or some of patients were observed. And these are the results. So again, if we look, if we look at the relapse in the site where the lymph node, uh, where the lymph nodes were removed, it shows that the radiation is uh, uh, is beneficial. It does it does decrease the risk of recurrence of a disease in the area where it was delivered. And there was about 44% of patients benefited. The green line shows patients who who did receive radiation, and the white line shows patients who did not receive radiation. And you see, few, fewer patients were without the disease when they received radiation. But does, so we know that it decreases the risk of local recurrence, but when we look at the length of life, does, this rec does the radiation decrease the risk of the length of, uh, the, uh, decrease the risk of uh, dying of melanoma? Unfortunately, these curves were not significant, and actually, I should not probably mention that, but the radiation curve was below the, the curve uh, uh, of patients who did not receive radiation. But statistically, these this, this lines were superimposed. So the conclusion from this trial was it is beneficial to decrease the risk of local recurrence, but it does not prolong patients' life. So in this short presentation, I was talking about new developments and standard methods of treatment of patients with melanoma. I also gave you a little bit information on the general, general information about melanoma, frequency, and prognosis. <coughs> so the frequency of melanoma continues to rise, and the initial stages of melanoma should be treated surgically. Right now, interferon alpha in two forms, either intron A or silaton, are the only FDA-approved treatments for patients with resected melanoma. We are very excited about the clinical, tr clinical trials of a new vaccine, MAGE A3 vaccine, and we are excited about the use of ipilimumab in patients with stage 3 melanoma. The, result, uh, the studies are either completed accrual, or they are close to completing accrual, but it will take a little bit of time before we have the results. And the use of radiation therapy to some degree is controversial, and I'm not going to discuss it again. Okay, thank you. That's all.